All right, guys, here's what the video today is going to be about. It's two parts, really. One is primarily about summarizing what we've been doing over the last week um, or so since we took our data last week with the, uh, the toy cars um, and then tried to apply the knowledge we gained from that data in a discussion and then today to like problem solving a new, new scenario that you hadn't seen before, trying to use just different tools you developed in your math classes to try to figure it out. Uh, which was all very, very cool and excited for you to see the different solutions that come up tomorrow. What we'll do in this video is summarize some key points that you must know um, about constant velocity motion and be able to apply. Um, this is really a chance to like take all the key ideas and kind of put them in one spot and then start to work on the application. So we'll review that a little bit. We'll also um, put it through an application so you can see a little bit of how to use it and then finally, we'll end the video with um, a practice problem that I'd like you to try this evening just to test your skills. So that's where we're going uh, with this video. We're going to call this the constant velocity model as we talk about it. And the main reason we call it a model is similar to the reason we call um, the predictions that hurricane forecasters or even just regular weather people make about different um, storms that they're tracking, what they're doing is they're taking initial conditions about that storm, where it starts, how fast the initial speeds are, what the, the initial pressures are, and then they're letting that play out over time to try to make a best prediction of where it ends up. In a similar way, what we do with our models is we say, here's an object we think is moving with a constant velocity, therefore this model applies. Let's take its initial conditions, plug it in, see what kinds of predictions we get. If those match what the object actually does, then what we have is a model that works. And so we're going to work today to figure out what does that model look like, assuming that the objects we're working with all travel with a constant velocity. So what I have here just to start us off is, is a graph of position versus time. I know the other day in our discussion we talked about data as time versus position. Um, either is fine, they both have the same kind of information in them, um, but just as a convention, physicists typically use position versus time graphs. And so from here on out, when you, you see us reference motion graphs, it will always be position versus time. And you can see here we're using the variable x to represent the position. Um, m here represents meters as the, the standard unit, and then time in seconds here. So first thing you have to know is for any constant velocity particle, the position time graph will be linear. And because it's linear, that means the equation form is going to look like what we identified last week as the y slope intercept formula, y equals mx plus b. Because of that relationship, we know that this equation works for that line. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in some of these variables into that equation so that you can start to see that we'll form an equation that is predictive for motion. So the way we do that is by saying, well, the y variable in this scenario is x. M we'll come back to in just a second. The x variable in this scenario is t plus the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is the point at which the y the y-axis is intersected by the line. And this right here would represent, for position, the initial point of the object's position. And so we're going to call that x sub naught, or x naught. It's a little small o that we're writing as a subscript for the x, and that represents uh, initial position. So this would be where the object's located initially. So we left out what the slope here is, and uh, as we've alluded to, if we were to take the slope of this graph, what we would have is sort of delta x divided by delta t, and delta x divided by delta t is going to be a value we're going to define right now as capital V, which stands for velocity. Now, velocity is very similar to speed, but not the same thing as speed, and we'll start to be very pro uh, particular with our language. Um, so the slope here represents v, the velocity. Those are the basic tools that we have when we look at the constant velocity model. We have both a graph to work with, linear in form, and we also have this equation. Now, let's make a note here of what each of these things are. This x represents the final position of our object because if we plug in a time and a speed and an initial position, we'll figure out where that object's going to end up in its final 
um, at, at the final time. Um, and I believe we've articulated what all the others are. Velocities will always have the units of meters per second. And for this graph, we can see that the slope has a very specific feature. It is constant in that it is the same for the entire period. It does not change the slope. Um, and this is a very, very specific quality of constant velocity particles. So constant slope will indicate for this kind of graph that we have a constant velocity. Those are the basics of what we need to know about the constant velocity model and the rest is just being able to apply this in, in many different scenarios. So let's go ahead and look at an application. So what I drew here was a data, uh, a chart of, uh, or sort of rather a graph of someone's motion um, where I have them starting at a position of four meters and then every two seconds they decrease their position a meter um, so that they're coming down. And so let's look at a couple of the key features of this graph. Well, I can see that it follows a constant slope and I can literally, once I write that and have made that conclusion, scratch out the word slope and write velocity. And immediately what I figure out is that this is a constant velocity. If I wanted to figure out what that slope was, I'd be essentially figuring out what is the velocity. And so to do that, we'll say V equals delta X over delta T. Delta X in this case would be for these two points, if this is X final, this is X initial, it would be two minus three over, this uh, delta is four minus two, so two which will give us a negative one-half meters per second. So this slope, or the velocity of this graph, is negative one-half meters per second. So notice something interesting here. Velocities can have a positive or negative value, and that positive or negative value tells you the direction that they move. You can see that because for this object, it moves from four to three to two to one. That's the, what we've defined here as the negative direction. You could imagine a line that goes from one all the way up, and we would say that has a positive velocity because it's going in the other direction, has a positive slope. So for velocities, and this is the key feature that makes them different than speed, they have a direction, that num the direction is given by the sign of that number. What else can we do with this? Well, I see that it's linear, which means that it follows this form of x equals vt plus x naught. And I could plug in some number of values that I know for this to get a general equation for this object. I can say x equals negative one half times t plus, and then this x naught, well, x naught was the initial location of the object. That would be four. And so this equation here would be what I would call the equation of motion for that object. Now what can you do with this equation of motion? Well, notice it has a functional form. This is exactly like pre-calculus, where we say, given some time period, you can find at any point the position of that particle. Any time period, you can find the position of that particle. So if I wanted to plug in to this equation, that time equals two seconds, what is the position of the, article, the particle? I could say two times negative one half is negative one, plus four is three, so x equals three at two seconds. If you look on my graph, two seconds, we're at three. So this is a predictive equation with this graph for this object's motion. And that's how we really use this, is to get all of that information um, about an object's motion. We'll call this, we'll often refer to this as the graphical representation of motion. We'll refer to this as the uh, equation of motion or the, the uh, equation way or the functional form of, of talking about the motion and we can make predictions about the values by plugging numbers in and getting the numerical solutions. So, let's talk about what you're going to try this evening. And sort of closely related to what we did in class today, but maybe a little simpler problem to start with. Um, and then tomorrow when we come into class and we look at your solutions, we'll incorporate this knowledge into that. Um, but here is your problem. So, sorry, I think there's a little bit glare in the video, which I can't get rid of, so I will 
tell you, of course, what the values are if you can't quite see them. Um, that way you know what it is that you're looking at. So here I have the hallway. That's what this rectangle represents. And here are two people. So this little box here represents my classroom, Star's classroom. This little box here represents the commons. And this little box represents Mr. Muma's room. Um, if you look here, I've defined some distances for you. So we have here from Yuma's room to the commons is 15 meters, from Yuma's room to Star's room it's 25 meters. I don't know if those are exactly right. I approximated based on what I know about the length of the hallway. So here's the condition. I have a person leaving the commons heading to Mr. Yuma's room at 0.5 meters per second. I have another person leaving Star's room at 0.75 meters per second and heading in the same direction. Here's what I'd like you to figure out. I'd first like you to plot what the graphical representation of this problem looks like. That means you'll have one graph that you'll sketch with two lines on it. One line representing each person's motion. Be careful about the initial positions. You will have to set up a coordinate system and be careful about the directions of the slope. The second thing I'd like you to do is come up with an equation of motion for each of those people. So there'll be one equation for each person. The third thing I'd like you to figure out is this. Which person gets to Mr. Muma's room first? And if they intersect, in other words, if they cross paths, at what point do they do that? So those are the two things you're trying to figure out. Make sure you have each of those as part of your solution. You will um, turn that in tomorrow, and we'll have a chance to better our skills at this particular model.